In chemistry, we're going to be doing a lot of measuring. So we're going to start this trimester by learning a little bit about what chemistry is, as well as the metric system and the type of measurements that we'll be using as scientists in this course. First of all, what is chemistry? It is the study of matter and all of the different changes that it can undergo. And you need to know what matter is, since chemistry studies matter. And that's anything that takes up space and has mass. So we'll be looking at the tiniest of atoms, as they do have volume and mass. And we'll also be looking at larger objects as well, and how those things work together uh, to undergo different chemical reactions and chemical changes. There are a lot of reasons to study chemistry. It helps us to explain the natural world, the world around us. It also helps prepare for careers, and even if you're not going to go into a science-related career, you are hopefully going to be going on to some two or maybe four-year degree, and a lot of the times freshman uh, requirements will have you be taking a science class. Chemistry is very good at helping you prepare for that. Also, it helps you to become an informed citizen, and whether you're at voting age or not yet, you will be, and there are many laws and things that will be up and coming uh, that you will have a chance to vote on or that you'll be voting for people who do make those calls. A little history about chemistry. Um, alchemists were the very first chemists. And if you don't know what alchemy is, it, they uh, searched for a way to change metal into gold. Were not successful, but they did develop a lot of tools and techniques uh, for working with chemicals. That, and some of those techniques we still use today. Now currently, um, chemistry has changed a lot since alchemy. And Anton Lavoisier is one of the scientists that we give credit for some of those big discoveries. He's our father of modern day chemistry. He took science from just, at his point in time, very observational, using your five senses to get an idea of what you see, hear, smell, feel, and kind of transformed that into a science of measurement. And instead of just using your five senses, actually measuring objects, measuring mass, seeing what you have and what you have at the end of a reaction. The two biggest things that you'll need to remember on the test and the final will be some of the things that he specifically um, is credited for. And that would be the discovery that oxygen is needed for combustion reactions. And he also gave us the law of conservation of mass. And that law is something that we'll be discussing more as we go throughout the trimester. Now there are two different types of measurements, and we use both of them in chemistry, but I would say that we use quantitative numbers more. Uh, quantitative data is anything that gives you a number. So if you can uh, assign a number to it and a unit, for instance, a test tube is 12 centimeters long. There is a specific number and a unit so that we would know exactly uh, what that piece of data is. When we do quantitative measurements, we are always going to be using SI units, and SI is the international system of units, which would be our metric system. We also have qualitative data, and these would be pieces of data that are descriptive. So this would be your five senses. What does it look like? What color is it? What does it smell like? Um, if it's something that you could touch, what's the feel of it? These are non-numerical results, so using comparative type things, small, large, those would be all qualitative pieces of data. Now I said we were going to use the metric system, and this is a decimal system. So you can see in the picture off to the side here that there are a lot of different numbers, but if you look closely at how the numbers change, the numbers are only increasing or decreasing by a power of 10 meaning that the decimal is only moving to the right or the left one place every time. And the number is getting larger or smaller depending on which way you go. But that's what the metric system is. It's a very easy system to use because you are only moving the decimal uh, to the right or the left. You don't need to memorize uh, certain characteristics like there are 12 inches in a foot or how many yards are in a mile or things like that. Um, as long as you know kind of where your starting point is, you can easily move your decimal to the right or the left. So it's really easy to use. Uh, so we will be using this to convert units. If we want to go from centimeters to meters, or maybe grams to kilograms, we can do that by moving our decimal by factors of 10. And I want you to be very cautious whenever you're doing measurements in here, and in every lab that we do, any measurement that you give me needs to have a unit. It is never acceptable just to have a number written down without a unit behind it. 
because that number could mean anything. And if you said that, you know, you said 25, 25 what? 25 grams? 25 people in the class, 25 steps across the room, 25 inches in your shoe. Who knows what it could be? That number could be anything and everything. So every measurement needs to have a unit, and that way we know exactly what you're talking about. So as we look at units, we're going to look at some of those metric units. We're going to start with mass. Mass is the measurement of the amount of matter that you have. Mass is going to be the same regardless of where it's placed it does not change. So the mass of, for instance, that 12 centimeter test tube is going to have the same mass in my room, Mr. Leap's room, in a whole different country, wherever you are, the mass of an object should and does not change. We use the gram to measure uh, mass and we will be using balances. We have triple beam balances that we'll be using. Uh, we'll also have some digital balances that we get out occasionally as well. Now, a lot of the times we get mass and weight confused. They are two different um, topics of conversation. Weight is actually a force. And when you take physics, you'll talk more about weight. But weight is a force of attraction between the object, for instance, you, and Earth. And it is based off of gravity. So even at different areas or points on Earth's surface, you have a different weight because gravity changes based off of the distance from the center of the Earth. So uh, if we were to take the mass of a person on Earth, and let's say they only weighed 100 pounds, like in this picture, and then we go to the moon. The moon is a different size. It has a different gravitational pull. And so the weight of that person would only be 16.6 pounds. Weight is measured in pounds. It is not a metric unit. We're going to use a scale, like maybe the one that you have in your bathroom. Uh, more realistically, maybe a 180 pound person, you would weigh about 30 pounds on the moon. And because it's based off of gravity, if you went to Jupiter, which is a much larger planet, and the gravitational pull is is harder, uh, they you would experience a greater amount of pounds if you were on Jupiter than you are here on Earth. All right, back to some metric units. Length is a very common one that we use. Length is the uh, measurement from end to end of an object's of an object. Uh, you have all used rulers. Many of the times maybe you're used to using inches. We're not going to be using inches in here. We will only ever be using meters, centimeters, or millimeters. Probably centimeters and millimeters are the two most common just because our lengths are normally smaller. But meter is our standard of unit. Volume is another one. Whenever we uh, a volume of a liquid, volume of a solid, we need to know the amount of space that it is taking up if we're using a solid object, the volume is going to be the standard unit, would be meters cubed. And that's a derived unit, meaning that it's taken from another metric unit, for instance, length, because in order to get the volume of a cube, well, we would need to know the length, the width, and the height, and multiply those together. So that SI unit we call a derived unit, whenever anything's squared or cubed. But a lot of the times we're going to be using the volume of a liquid. And volumes of liquids are going to be measured in liters. So milliliters or liters. Liters is the metric unit, but milliliters is really common just due to the smaller amounts that we'll be measuring. And then we also have temperature. Temperature is not how hot or cold something is, and that's a common answer, and that is not correct. Temperature is actually the average energy that particles have. Particles are always moving, so they have what we call kinetic energy. And uh, if they're moving very, very quickly, then your thermometer is going to be reading a higher temperature. If the particles are moving very, very slowly, then we would say that that object is cold. But temperature is the amount of energy that those particles have. There are three different types of measurements when it comes to temperature. Fahrenheit's what we're used to here in the United States but Celsius and Kelvin are going to be the two that we use here in chemistry. Celsius, because the thermometers that we'll be using measure in Celsius, but Kelvin is actually our metric unit when it comes to temperature. When we talk about heat, heat is the movement of energy, and heat will always go from warm to cold, so it will always be moving to the cooler object. When we convert 
uh, temperatures. We just said that we're going to be using Celsius thermometers, but we're going to be using Kelvin as well for our measurements. And so we need to be able to convert. If you're given a Celsius number, for instance, something is 50 degrees Celsius, we can convert that to Kelvin by using the equation that you see here. Or if we know what our Kelvin amount is, we, we can convert that to Celsius by subtracting that 273 that you see. Notice that Kelvin is not degrees Kelvin. It's just called Kelvin, but we do use degrees Celsius. Kelvin has no negative number. The lowest number that you can go on the Kelvin scale is, is zero, and that would be referred to as absolute zero. And that would be the theoretical point where all matter stops moving. So even solid objects have moving pieces, and um, at zero Kelvin, they would no longer be moving. So that would be the lowest point that we could reach. And then lastly, to finish this up, uh, we have time. And time is going to be measured in seconds. And that's our metric unit 